The Scriptoria and the work of medieval copyists represents a fascinating chapter in the history of the written word. Whilst in today's digital age, publishing text is easier than it has ever been before, for over a millennium, medieval manuscripts carried our written heritage. It was in the solace of medieval monasteries, beyond the reach of the era's tumultuous social changes, that a meticulous and sacred art was practiced within the walls of the scriptorium. This was the realm of the medieval copyist, often a monk, but as we shall discover not always, their life was dedicated to the transcription of texts by hand. The scriptorium served as a crucial center for the preservation and dissemination of knowledge throughout the Middle Ages, playing a pivotal role in the survival of literature, religious texts, and importantly, scholarly work from antiquity. The transition from the classical world to the Middle Ages occurred with the fall of the Western Roman Empire, typically stated to be around 476 AD, and the intensification of what are generally considered to be barbarian invasions of Europe, which provoked chaos and destruction in what remained of civilization. Not only did these barbarian raids destroy human lives, their monuments and economic inventory, which resulted in profound demographic decline. But it was also the loss of artistic treasures, the ruin of roads, workshops, storehouses, irrigation systems, and agriculture. And not even the benign structures, such as libraries and collections of texts, were spared from this massive devastation. The scriptorium was more than just a workspace. It was a sanctuary of learning and devotion. Monks who worked as copyists embraced a life of solitude and discipline, with their days divided between prayer, labor, and study. The meticulous nature of their work required not only a deep commitment to religious life, but also a mastery of various skills, including calligraphy, illumination, and bookbinding. Armed with quill, ink, and parchment, these medieval copyists undertook the laborious task of transcribing texts. This process was not merely mechanical. It often demanded a profound understanding of the content of the works, an especially high degree of accuracy, and also an artistic touch, especially for illuminated manuscripts which were adorned with intricate designs, illustrations, and gold leaf. The creation of a single book could take many months or even years, reflecting the dedication and skill of these early scribes. The work of the medieval copyist extended well beyond the confines of religious texts. Scriptoriums became repositories of secular knowledge as well including classical Greek and Roman texts, legal documents, scientific treatises, and literary works. By copying these texts, monks played a critical role in preserving the intellectual heritage of the Western world, ultimately bridging the gap between antiquity and the Renaissance. Monasteries and their scriptoriums evolved into some of the earliest centers of learning in medieval Europe. They became places where knowledge was not only preserved, but also disseminated. These monks educated members of the clergy and nobility, laying the groundwork for the educational systems that would later emerge in Europe. This educational role was pivotal in slowly rekindling interest in learning and scholarship during the latter part of the Middle Ages, leading to the establishment of the first universities. Yet, why did monks occupy themselves with copying books? Of course, the obvious answer is that monasteries required books, Bibles and liturgical books at least. But that does not seem to cover the reality that medieval monasteries were almost single-handedly responsible for the preservation and transmission of all written materials that made it to the age of print. The answer can somewhat be gleaned from a remark made by Cassidorius. He was a statesman and historian 
who founded a monastery at Bavaria. In his institutions, he created a study guide for the monks of Bavaria, in which he writes about scribes and illuminators. A blessed purpose, a praiseworthy zeal, to preach to men with the hand, to set tongues free with one's fingers, and in silence to give mankind salvation to fight with pen and ink against the unlawful snares of the devil. For Satan receives as many wounds as the scribe writes the words of the Lord. So, if we combine this remark with Benedict of Nursia, often known as Saint Benedict, an Italian Christian monk, writer and theologian, who made reading an everyday part of his widely followed monastic rule, also known as the Rule of St. Benedict, it becomes quite clear that early on, books had become an important priority for monasteries. And whilst it used to be thought that all scribes were monks, we now know that in the early High Middle Ages, copyists, also including nuns, cathedral clerics, second sons, and lay craftsmen. For example, in 2019, a nun with blue teeth briefly made headlines. A medieval woman's early involvement in manuscript production was established. When scientists discovered small flecks of ultramarine pigment in her teeth, the pigment being from lapis lazuli, a deep blue metamorphic rock, and considered a semi-precious stone, which has been prized since antiquity for its intense color, the scientists that discovered her body concluded that she was likely a painter of illuminated medieval manuscripts. This is important for context. This meant that women, likely nuns, were also working as copyists, that they were trusted with more than mere copying, as the lapis lazuli was valuable and likely would have mostly been used for illumination of the manuscripts. By the 11th century, there was great progress in the art of copying. Among the Benedictines, particularly noteworthy is the work of Abbot Desiderius, who promoted the great cultural revival of Monte Cassino. The author Thomas Woods aptly summarizes this Benedictine rebirth, stating that Desiderius was the greatest of abbots of Monte Cassino after Benedict himself, and who became Pope Victor III in 1086. He specifically oversaw the transcription of Horace and Seneca, as well as Cicero's De Natura Deorium and Ovid's Fasti. Another monk from the same monastery, and a friend of Victor III, Archbishop Alfano, possessed a similar fluency in the works of the ancient writers, frequently quoting from Aristotle, Cicero, Plato, Varro, and Virgil and imitating Ovid and Horace in his own verse. Also worthy of mention is St. Anselm, who, whilst the abbot of Beck, recommended Virgil and other classical writers to his students. Therefore, it should be noted that it was the monks of Cassidorius and St. Benedict that gave the copy, so to speak, for the first editions of Cicero, Virgil, and other classical writers produced by the earliest printers of Germany and Italy in the 15th century. St. Columbianus and his Irish monks were also considered great instruments for the salvation of Western civilization. At least, this is the opinion of Thomas Cahill, as he categorically states in How the Irish Saved Civilization. His thesis, considered controversial by some critics, essentially boils down to the Irish, and the monks in particular, saved Western civilization from the destruction resulting from barbarism. St. Patrick took the first step, encouraging studies and the education of monks, and also the wider population. St. Columbianus com complemented St. Patrick's work of fostering culture and education. The latter's work took on great proportions forming another vanguard of monastic scribes at the beginning of the High Middle Ages. However, it is worth noting that these monks possessed certain peculiarities. They were obsessively persistent and copied any and every work that fell into their hands. As a result, Bobbio Abbey came to possess the largest collection of texts in the West. 
a 9th century catalogue bears witness to its extraordinary wealth. Even at that time, it possessed a collection of between six and seven hundred titles, from sacred and classical authors including Terence, Lucretius, Virgil, Horace, Perseus, Martial, Ovid, Valerius, Cicero, Seneca and Pliny. A remarkable achievement that is only eclipsed by its importance. Additionally, copies of some of the oldest extant Latin manuscripts are the product of Bobbio Abbey. These relics reveal not only the literary value, but also the artistic importance of manuscripts produced by the Irish monks and their disciples. The illuminations are particularly outstanding. Most notable are the detailed and decorative first letters, and a typical style of calligraphy that ultimately influenced many monasteries. The illustrations themselves were veritable treasures and were often colored with gold and lapis lazuli and several other precious resources. Musical tradition was also the object of their work. Psalms, sequences, graduals, and all types of liturgical codices, breveries, lectionaries, martologies, missals, which attest to the vast cultural education of the monks, as well as their obsessive and relentless copying. In the monastery of St. Gaul, which is arguably the most well-known and well-studied scriptorium, a new notation system for Gregorian chant emerged, which enabled the preservation of melodic tradition in written form, influencing a great part of Central and Eastern Europe. This system, preserved by the Codex Sangolensis 359, was written between 922 and 925 AD, and is still the standard for interpretation of Gregorian chant semology. Remember, this continued for centuries, with the monastic scriptorium remaining the primary location in which the majority of books were made, at least until the end of the 12th century. Though we have plenty of illuminations of individual scribes at work, hardly any images of monastic scribes working in groups appear to survive. Even so, we know that medieval scriptoria could be almost industrial in their scale. The most famous example is the scriptorium of Tours in the Carolingian period. Over the course of the first half of the 9th century, under four successive abbots, the scriptorium at St. Martin de Tours was the most important centre for the production of Bible manuscripts in the Carolingian Empire. The number of extant Tours Bible alone is impressive. Between 1796 and 1850, we count over 40 extant Bibles and over 20 Gospel books. Based on these numbers, it is estimated that the Tours Scriptorium produced an average of two Pandect Bibles, that is a single volume Bible, and a Gospel book every year for the entire first half of the 9th century. In order to sustain such a massive enterprise, the Tours Abbey required significant resources, not least of which was sheep for the making of parchment, as well as many personnel. It is believed that up to 20 copyists could work on unbound squires simultaneously, sometimes using different exemplars for the same book. There are many more examples of such division of labor, though the scale of the team efforts at Tours is quite exceptional. This almost assembly line style of producing manuscripts stands in stark contrast to other examples of famous individual medieval scribes who developed personal reputations for their work. There is Edwin, the Prince of Scribes. There is Demuth, a female scribe working in Wessovran in the 11th century. She did not sign any of her manuscripts, but we know of her because the community valued her contribution so much that they compiled a list of all 45 manuscripts she had copied. Another example is Otolo of Rengensburg, who offers quite a bit of detail about his training and work as a scribe in the works he authored himself. We know that he was entirely self-taught and that his skills were in great demand, not only in his own house, but also in other monasteries. 
to which he traveled in order to copy the books there. I find it fascinating and inspiring that expert scribes traveled and were in demand during such a tumultuous period. This fact is attested to several times. Still, the scribes who escaped anonymity are incredibly rare, at least for the early and high Middle Ages. In most cases, the scribes remained nameless. The impact of scriptoriums and the work of medieval copyists on society is profound and multifaceted, especially when considering their role during what has often been referred to quite dramatically as the Dark Ages. This period, characterized by marked societal turmoil, the fragmentation of the Western Roman Empire, and the loss of classical knowledge, might indeed have led to a complete cultural and intellectual vacuum were it not for these monastic scribes. In view of this scenario, referring to the monastic scribes, the author John B. O'Connor categorically affirms, had it not been for their intelligent and untiring efforts, Greek and Latin literature would have disappeared as completely as the literature of Babylonia and Phoenicia. So, I think it's fair to suggest that the cultural destiny of the Western world depended on the generous commitment of a few individuals true anonymous heroes. Gradually, especially with the creation of universities in the 12th century, the manuscript tradition transcended the scriptoria of the monasteries to all classes of society. Secular clergy, nuns, notaries, professional scribes, professors, students, etc. By the 12th century, the transmission of texts had largely been safeguarded. An uplifted Europe had overcome the difficulties of the transition from the classical to the medieval world. Therefore, in addition to transmitting texts, which is in itself something extraordinary, the monks gave us the example of wisdom, perseverance, by bequeathing the Christian and classical cultural tradition to subsequent centuries. Frankly, it is impossible to accurately calculate the mammoth consequences of this diligent undertaking. Nor can we surmise what would have become of today's Western culture if these monks had, for example, been exterminated by the barbarian hordes, or had simply become discouraged at that crucial moment. What is certain, however, is that the destiny of Western civilization passed through their hands. As such, Medieval monks, through the laborious copying and preservation of ancient texts, essentially saved the remnants of the classical civilization from potential oblivion. Many of the works of Greek and Roman philosophy, science and literature that are foundational to Western culture today, survived through the Middle Ages because of these scribes. Their scriptoria served as the custodians of knowledge at a time when such wisdom was under great threat from societal collapse, wars, as well as the ravages of time. Ultimately, perhaps one of the most significant impacts of the medieval scriptorium was its role in setting the stage for the Renaissance. The texts preserved and copied by these monks became the source material for the humanists of the Renaissance. Rediscovery and renewed interest in classical texts during the Renaissance were made possible because these works had been meticulously copied and safeguarded by generations of monastic scribes. The intellectual curiosity and pursuit of knowledge that define the Renaissance owes much to the foundational work of these medieval copyists. Thus, the scriptoria and the work of medieval copyists represents a fascinating chapter in the history of the written word. In an age before the advent of the printing press, these dedicated monks safeguarded the continuity of knowledge and culture. The notion that medieval monks saved Western civilization during the Dark Ages might be hyperbole and an oversimplification of the complex tapestry of history. Yet there is a kernel of truth to the idea through their dedication to preserving and copying texts. These monks maintained the continuity of knowledge through one of Europe's most turbulent periods. Their scriptoria were not just repositories of texts. 
They were the lifelines by which the wisdom of the ancients was transmitted to future generations, ultimately contributing to the resurgence of learning and culture during the Renaissance. In this sense, the impact of medieval copyists on society is immeasurable, reminding us of the enduring power and importance of preserving knowledge, even in the darkest of times. Their legacy is a testament to the power of the written word and its enduring role in human civilization. Thank you for watching.